Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for joining me today. I just got back from an interview with a law firm. As you can see, I'm wearing my interview outfit. Uh, so I thought right now would actually be a great time to address the process of getting a job at a big law firm. Um, it's kind of a mystifying process if you aren't in law school and even if you are up until the point that basically on-campus interviewing starts it's very hard to get a sense of what the process actually will look like and I for me personally I think that generates a lot of anxiety I like to know the general contours of whatever process I will be subject to so I wanted to give you guys a quick outline of what that process is like what you need to prepare and what it will feel like to go through it a preliminary question is what is a big law job um, the way that it's referred to sometimes can be confusing the definition is a little bit nebulous in that different firms use it in slightly different ways but generally speaking it means a job with a law firm that is usually at least a hundred attorneys and pays the market rate for big law firms which I believe right now for a first year starting associate is 190k um, not including bonuses which is a lot of money. A lot of the work is on the defense side of things so the most typical outlook would be you know you're working on behalf of a large corporation that has hired you to take care of some matter for them whether that's in the context of litigation or whether that's on the deal making slash corporate governance slash transactional side. So that's basically what working in big law means. So I didn't know this going into law school, but the hiring timeline for this particular process of working at a big law firm is very compressed. Basically, at the end of the summer between your first year of law school and your second, you will go through what is called on-campus interviewing, or OCI, um, at most schools. Now, keep in mind that I'm speaking from my personal experience as a student here at Stanford. Other schools do things slightly differently, of course. Every school and every student will have a slightly different experience. But this is the best uh, that I can generalize from what I've gone through very recently. So on-campus interviewing brings a large number of law firm employers to campus all at once and you do basically a very compressed process right then and there. It is very convenient in a sense for students because you don't have to go out and send out your resume or hunt down firms. You can choose from a list that the school has in a sense pre-screened for you because the school typically will only invite employers that it knows to be reputable, that it has some connection with in the past, or you know that it, it knows that the employer is a desirable one for students. On-campus interviewing, as I said, takes place in between your first and second year and you are basically interviewing for the summer internship that you will have after your second year, although I hesitate to call it an internship because you will most likely be paid an extremely high amount of money, um, basically the prorated uh, amount you would have made um, as, an, as a first year associate attorney at that firm. So that looks like anywhere from between like 33 to 37 hundred dollars a week so not exactly internship money you are basically interviewing for that second summer position after the end of your first summer and if all goes well in a lot of cases that second summer position turns into a full-time offer so in a sense when you are choosing a firm during OCI you are setting it up such that if you wanted to you could stay at that firm for you know the, next, the first few years out of law school or conceivably your entire career. So it can be a decision that is full of import and weight if that's what you want it to be. Of course, you're not locked into anything other than, you know, once you accept your OCI offer for the second summer, you're basically, unless you have a very good reason, bound to go there for your second summer. But it can be a very fraught time because it does feel like the decision that you make at the end of one L year, basically, can have a huge impact on the direction you will go throughout the rest of your career. Now that's from the perspective of someone who just went through that very frazzling experience. I'm sure if you spoke to a seasoned attorney who has had a career that went a few different directions, they might say something different. So the OCI process involves four basic steps. The first one is bidding, at least, you know, again, here at Stanford. Basically, from the list of employers that is coming to OCI, you put in a number of bids and rank the firms in the order of your preference. And then here we have an algorithm that sorts employers and students and matches them for the screening interviews. So we were allowed to bid a maximum of 20 slots. 
and then there are options to add more employers after the sorting has happened if the employer has open slots available. I would say people seem to do anywhere between three firms if they know they want a very, very specific and narrow focus to a much higher number. The highest number I heard a classmate do this year was in the 40s, like high 30s, 40s. Uh, for the screener interviews, which is a lot. I think the average is probably somewhere between 18 and 20. Um, I happen to do 22. So the screening interviews are very short. They're just 20 minutes, and you basically meet with one or two um, attorneys from the firm. We do it on campus. Some schools do it you know, in the area or at a local hotel. Um, you sit down with them, you discuss your resume really quickly, and you ask them questions. And that is the screening process, or step two of OCI. In some ways, as I said, it's very easy because you're basically just on campus. You're going from room to room. It's very close to you, probably, since you know many of you must live on campus or nearby. Um, in another sense, it is very draining and difficult because, you know, on your busiest day, you may have eight or nine screener interviews basically in a row. And then at the end, normally there might be like a firm sponsored reception or a special dinner that you get invited to, depending on how the firm sees you. And that reception or that dinner is obviously an extension of the interview process. I mean, it is a little bit more casual and informal, and you are chatting with the attorneys more one-on-one -on -one in that setting, but everything you say is under evaluation. So that is basically the screener process. Once you have gone through that series of 20-minute interviews, firms will get back to you with what's called a callback offer, which is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. They will call you normally um, and invite you to come to the firm office for a more extended interview. So typically, callbacks involve meeting anywhere from like three to six or seven of the attorneys in the office. You rotate through with those attorneys and chat with them for 20 to 30 minutes. Different firms have different approaches. Some do a very sort of straight-laced, like, tell me about a time you struggled, or tell me about a time you worked in a team to overcome a challenge, like those sort of behavioral interview questions you could get out of a book. Some firms take an approach that is a lot more conversational, more casual, you know, you just chat. Um, but one thing I found is that it is important to have a resume that has something for the interviewer to latch onto. So, you know, even if you're an incoming 1L law student or a 0L, a pre-law student, and you're thinking, oh, I don't have to worry about that, it is kind of nice to keep in the back of your mind, though, that whatever job you do for your 1L summer, that is probably going to be your most substantive legal experience. And it's good to seek out a job where you actually will get to do some legal work so that when you go through these interviews, you have something to talk about and you could say, oh, I wrote this motion insert or I researched this topic and this is the conclusion I came to rather than, you know, I, I don't know, compiled a spreadsheet or something extremely basic. And you, you probably won't be doing that at your 1L summer job, but it is something to think about. So the callbacks, you know, you basically schedule them right after OCI and you go to the firm, chat with the attorneys in succession, and sometimes they take you out to lunch or coffee to give you sort of um, a more informal setting. Depending on the firm, um, you should be able to talk to a range of people from you know more senior partners to younger associates. And the callback is a little bit more of a time for you to ask questions about the firm and try to figure out what you would like. The rates of summer offers from callbacks do vary a lot depending on a bunch of factors but one way to think about it is that you know these attorneys typically bill a lot of money for their time and if a firm is investing an entire morning or an entire afternoon into you you probably have a decent shot so it's okay to ask a, a few more questions about you know what the firm culture is like what kind of work uh, people in different practice groups do that sort of thing and finally the fourth stage of getting the job is of course getting the offer. So if you're fortunate enough to have multiple callbacks, um, you might get multiple offers. And at that point, um, you wanna check with your Office of Career Services for the specifics, but basically law firms are obligated to hold open offers for a certain amount of time. You wanna make sure that the law firms understand exactly how long you can come for the summer. Um, you wanna get confirmation about how much you're going to be paid for the summer. But other than that, then it's time for you to really consider your personal circumstances and what sort of work environment, um, city, what sort of colleagues, 
So a few more tips about how to prepare for this interview process and this job search process. I think first of all, the threshold question is whether or not you're actually interested in working in big law. I mean, it is kind of the path of least resistance in law school and for a lot of people, it can be a very fulfilling career, but I think it's important to be realistic, especially if you're someone who's not super familiar with um, big law, like you don't have, you know, your mom doesn't work for um, Gibson Dunn or whatever. It's important to understand the conditions on the ground that you'll be dealing with, like the hours you'll be working, the amount of face time you're expected to put in, that sort of thing. So a lot of firms have, for example, like a target billing rate, uh, billing amount. And one thing I didn't understand when starting law school is that the number of hours you bill and the number of hours you work are not one to one. So you, a lot of the time now that you spend doing administrative stuff, like sending emails, sometimes taking calls, that is not billable time. So if a firm says, you know, our billing requirement, the floor, like the basic um, minimum is 2,000 hours, that's not even to say that you'll work 2,000 hours that year. You'll need to work more than that in order to hit 2,000 billable hours. So that's one thing, just being realistic about the workload and the working environment. I mean, the money is great and a strong reason, obviously, why people go to work in big law, but at the end of the day, it's not everything and you need to consider other factors in your life. The next step in preparing is researching firms. So it can be very daunting and it, it was very daunting for me to start researching firms because you have this long list of what basically sounded like a jumble of last names and it's very hard to differentiate the firms when you're just looking at their website. One thing is, you know, you want to go into the interview with a good sense of why you're interested in that firm. So a basic mistake that you wouldn't think that future lawyers would make, but plenty of people do, is to go into a firm and say, you know, I'm really interested in your transactional practice and they're a litigation only firm. Or, you know, I really want to do white collar and they don't have that practice area basic stuff like that you definitely need to cover in your research. The way I did it, uh, I definitely could have researched more, but I basically made a list of all the firms I was going to interview with and I wrote down just notes to myself about uh, basic firm facts like where the headquarters are, what are the practice areas in this office, which office am I interviewing for, um, who are the interviewers, what do they do, that sort of thing, where do they go to school. All of these things that you need to just have as a baseline in case it comes up in the interview or you need to demonstrate your interest in the firm by you know, just your basic knowledge of it. A really good way to research firms is to reach out to alumni um, and you know, set up a quick informational chat with them about what they like about the firm, what differentiates that firm from other firms and why they chose to go there really talking to people to get a sense of a lot of the intangible factors like the office environment and the culture is going to be really helpful in deciding where you want to go. Of course, you can also look at online resources like Vault and I think the Chamber's Guide and Above the Law, but you have to understand that firms have a certain amount of input into their Vault ranking, for example, like they monitor that ranking or some firms do anyway. And so it's kind of hard to tell from just a cold number online how much is actually directly relevant about that number. So it is good to try to talk to people um, about that. You also want to decide starting out whether or not you're more interested in litigation work or transactional work. You don't have to have a clear sense one way or the other. Uh, and certainly, you know, people go through this process not knowing and then decide later. But it is always good to have some kind of talking point about why you're slightly more interested in one or the other. It's difficult because law school really does not, especially after the first year alone, law school really does not prepare us to talk about transactional work at all. We don't get a lot of exposure to it in the classroom. Um, and litigation, the kind of exposure that law school classes give you is really toward thinking about appellate litigation, which not a ton of firms do. For example, you know, you just want to be able to talk succinctly and cogently about, you know, if you say you're interested in litigation, have a talking point about that. Like, oh, I like brief writing, or, you know, I did this class that simulated a case and I really enjoyed that because X, Y, Z. You have to have something at the tip of your tongue ready so that when people ask you, even if you're saying, I'd like to rotate through and try different things, you don't give just a blank stare or you know a blank slate of 
a non-answer. Finally, logistically, you'll need to prepare your resume and questions for the interviewer. So you obviously want to have your most updated resume. If your summer job ended right before OCI, make sure you include some details about that. So for example, I worked on a First Amendment issue um, at my summer job. I put that in my resume and that comes up in my interviews all the time. If you're just coming out of college, it's not a big deal. Your resume will probably be a little bit sparser, but you could put college activities, clubs, um, law school activities, all of that can go on there as well. And you definitely want to have questions for the interviewers prepared and you want to have more than you think you'll need. I thought at first that I would need maybe three questions for the interviewers right at the end, but I did get a few interviews where the interviewer just sat back and was like, what do you have, what do you want to know about me? And didn't ask me a single question about myself, which is strange, but you need to be able to deal with that. Um, so some of the questions you might ask about are, you know, the firm culture, um, the matters that that particular attorney worked on, what they like about their practice, what they don't like about it, why they went to that firm, whether there's something in law school that they did that they thought, you know, really built a skill that they use as a practicing attorney and that was useful. Uh, billable hours requirements. I mean, attorneys like to give advice and what you're basically doing in especially the screener is positioning yourself as a candidate that the interviewer could see themselves working with and as someone who it's worth advising. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a better sense of what it's like to interview for a big law job. Thank you so much for watching guys. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so now. And if you have any other questions about law school, um, preparing to be an attorney, anything like that, please leave it in the comments below and I will try to address it in my next video. Thank you so much, bye.